Turn in your Bibles with me tonight to the book of Matthew chapter 23. And I want to begin talking to you tonight um, something the Lord gave me in prayer. Uh, I believe we're going to be talking about this for several weeks on a Wednesday night. Never can tell how long we're going to stay on the subject. I know we started talking about change in the beginning of the year on Sundays. And before it was over, we talked about change for four months. And really, we're still talking about change, even though we've transferred to talking about the grace of God. How many of you know it takes the grace of God to change? So really, we're still talking about change, even on Sundays. But I like to talk about a, a totally different subject on Wednesday nights because we have a different crowd on Wednesday nights. And, and uh, all of those who do not attend on Wednesday nights would get behind if we just kept talking about grace. And so I like to talk about two different subjects on Wednesday and a different one on Sunday. And what I want to begin talking to you tonight about, and again, I believe we'll be on it for several weeks, is I want to begin talking to you about the heart of a Pharisee. Um, if you remember in the New Testament, Jesus was very loving, he was very merciful, very patient, very kind with sinners, but he was not very patient with the religious people uh, of that time called the Pharisees or the Sadducees or the scribes, those types of people that were very religious thought they knew God, uh, thought they were better than other people, thought they were holier than other people. And, you know, if you can read through the New Testament, you find out that Jesus had a very low tolerance for that type of person. And you, you see a side of Jesus that you didn't really see when he was interacting with the sinner. You know, he would encounter... He would encounter a sinner, and it's just like his compassion would come out. His mercy would come out of him for that person. He usually would not judge them or, or criticize them. He usually would show them love and mercy. But when it came to the Pharisee, oh my, they got the, you know, the Bible says that Jesus is the lion and the lamb. Well, they got the lion. They got the, that side of Jesus where he was at, you know, more, a little more tough on them. And I believe we can see why. There's a few things we're going to get into. I believe one of the reasons that Jesus was so tough on the Pharisees, because how many of you know the Bible says that when you show mercy, you will receive mercy? Well, what happens if you don't show mercy? He also says, do not judge and you will not be judged. So if you're very judgmental upon people, then you're going to receive, basically you're sowing judgment and you're going to, you're going to reap it. That's what's going to happen. And that's a picture of the Pharisees. They were very judgmental, very critical. And I went through the scriptures, uh, the Gospels, and just really read all of the encounters that Jesus had with the Pharisees and identified just a few things that you begin, a few patterns that you begin to see in the life of a Pharisee. Now, if you, you know, you read through the Bible and you can identify many people that would be worthy of imitating, worthy of being like them, the apostles, the faith of Abraham. But when you read through the Bible, you also see some examples of people that you want to avoid at all costs. You do not want to be anything like them. The Pharisees is a great example of what not to do as a Christian. Anybody ever learn lessons that way? Sometimes you, you work places or you spend time with people and you didn't really learn what you should do, but you learned what you shouldn't do. <laughs> That's kind of what we have in the examples of the Pharisees. And as I started reading this, and I realized there, there's a, a huge amount of information in the Gospels about this group of people called the Pharisees. And he and Je Jesus and this group of people were constantly at odds. They were constantly button heads, and he was constantly reserving his worst criticism for this group of people. So if I can see that, man, this, these, this group of people stirs up the anger of God more than, you know, any other people that I've seen. I want to kind of study it and look at it and go, what was it about them that angered him so much? What was it about this group of people that offended him so much? And better yet, do we resemble them in any way? Does the, does the American church, the modern church, resemble this group of people? Because if we do, then we need to change. And sometimes... When I read about the Pharisees, I actually do. I actually see some, a section of the church, not the church as a whole, but I see this tendency in us to be judgmental, to be critical, to be, uh, or to walk in hypocrisy. 
And these are the things that Jesus came down on so hard. So let's start in Matthew chapter 23. He's got a whole chapter <laughs> devoted. In Matthew chapter 23, he's got a whole chapter devoted to criticizing the Pharisees. So we're just going to read that chapter. We may stop and discuss a little bit of it along the way. But let's just start in verse 1. It says, Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees, they sit on Moses' seat. Which means they're, they're in that place of authority to, to judge the people. You know, they were put there. He said, so practice and observe whatever they tell you, but not what they do. For they preach, but they do not practice. So the first thing he says about the Pharisees is that they're really good teachers. And the things that they're telling you are accurate and you should do them. The reason is, is because they were, they were essentially teaching the law. That's what they were doing. And he's telling them, you know, uh, what they're telling you is good, it's helpful, it's needful, it's the law of God, you need to do it. But he said, make sure that you're doing what they say and not what they do. Any of you ever said that to your kids? Uh, do as I say, not as I do? <laughs> well, you're like the Pharisees. That's, that's how they did. That's what Jesus told, them to, told us to be like when we looked at them. He said, you can listen to what they say, but not, do not look at what they do. Because their actions do not match up with what they are preaching. You know, this has been one of my goals uh, as, a, as a, a preacher. I've been really teaching, preaching the Word of God since I was a teenager. And I, you know, recognized this early on. And I purposed in my heart, I'm really going to endeavor uh, to practice what I preach. You know, if I'm, if I'm preaching on a particular subject, I'm going to endeavor to do that thing in my life. So what ends up happening is I end up not preaching on a lot of subjects because I don't, <laughs> I don't do them. No, I'm just kidding. That's not true. But if I'm not doing them, then, uh, then I want to start doing them before I start preaching on them. If I start seeing a revelation in the Word of God about uh, a particular area of my life, and I, and I know that God is asking me to communicate it to the people, and I go, well, hold on, I got to make sure I'm doing this in my life first before I start, I start preaching it, because Jesus has a problem with that, and we can see it very clearly in His problem with the Pharisees. He said, but they, they preach, but they do not practice. Verse four, He says they tie heavy burdens that are hard to bear, and they lay them upon the people, but they themselves are not willing to move them, uh, are not willing to move even with a finger. So here, he, he identifies another problem, is that they have a really strict guideline of how you should live, and they're telling people that they have to live that way, but then they themselves are not living that way. Now, I understand as we're reading this, you might think, yeah, pastor, that's all for you. You know, this is all about teaching people. Yeah, but it actually applies to you in, in several ways. It applies to all of us. Number one, it applies to us as parents. Because many times we, we ask, we put burdens on our children, or we ask our children to live a certain way, and we're not. You know, how, how many of you know it does not do very good to tell your kids, now you can't watch this on the TV, but then when they go out of the room, you just put it on. Now, I understand, for example, I might not let my son watch, uh, you know, a grizzly bear ripping apart, uh, you know, his prey or something just by nature of the fact that he's too young for that. Not that there's anything inappropriate with the Discovery Channel, but I'm talking about sinful things that you say, well, you're too young to hear that cursing, or you're too young to see that sexual content on TV, so you have to get out. Well, is that appropriate that you would want them to live holy, but you don't? I find myself falling into this next category where you want your children to eat healthy, and you won't let them. Sometimes me and Jen will go somewhere, and we'll get a Coke, and we make the kids drink juice, and they, we, they want Coke, you know? Now, we don't drink Coke a lot, but you see the principle there, it's like, well, Dad, I don't understand. Why can't I have Coke? You know, you're drink, you're, you and Mom are drinking Coke. Well, that's the same principle of, I don't want this for you. I want, I want you to eat better than this. I want you to live better than this. Yeah, well, then you need to be willing to do it. And if, and if the answer is not to go, okay, you can have Coke, the answer is I need to stop drinking it. You see what I'm saying? So the answer is not... You know, the answer for us is when whoever you're, that God's given you authority over, maybe it's your kids, maybe you're a manager or you're a supervisor, 
at your workplace or whoever God's given you authority over, it's not pleasing to God when you hold people to this high standard and you never let them get away with anything and you're, you're always calling them on every mistake every, and you're holding them to this super high standard, but then you don't hold yourself to that same standard. It's not pleasing to God. And actually, it's one of the things that he was criticizing here about the Pharisees. He said they put these heavy burdens that are hard to bear on people. They put them on the shoulders of the people, but they themselves are not willing to even move them with their fingers. Verse 5. He says they do all of their deeds to be seen by others. For they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long, and they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seat in the synagogue, greetings in the marketplace. They love to be called rabbi by others. Now stop there. So basically what he's saying, in, saying there is that they love to do their good deeds in front of people in order that they may be seen. Now I want to talk about this for just a moment. Because doing, this does not mean that all of your good deeds have to be done in secret. Actually, when you read Matthew chapter 5 and he's talking about light and salt, he says that it's good for people to see your good deeds so that they may glorify your heavenly Father. So it's not that all your good deeds have to be done in secret, but it's the motive. And that's what he addresses here. He says, they do all of their deeds so that... So he's addressing motive now. They do all of their good deeds. Why do they do them? So that they will be seen by other people. I remember the first time I was in high school and our, our principal was, uh, was Catholic. And she asked me to say a prayer. I, was, I think I was a sophomore in high school. And she asked me to say a prayer at a high school graduation. And so I remember that... When she asked me that, I was like, yeah, that's no big deal. I pray all the time. I mean, no big deal. You just get up and pray from your heart. I mean, no big deal. You know, you just get up and, and you pray. And I remember her asking to see my prayer. When it came time, she wanted to see it. And I was like, what are you talking about? She's like, you, like, you wrote it out, right? It's, it's written out. I want to see your prayer. And I said, no, I don't have, my prayer's not written out. I mean, I was just going to get up there and pray from my heart. <laughs> you know, and she didn't understand that. Like, no, you got to write it out. You don't know what you're going to say. I'm like, no, it's just going to come from my heart. That's how I pray. But I see that in this, it's like, why would you write it out? What's the point of writing it out? It's because you're not really praying to God. You're praying for these people. You got to say it just right. You got to write it out so that it comes out just right and that all your words sound really good and it's all put together well so that the people who are listening, they're not praying with you. No one's even praying. You're just reading something. <laughs> That's not prayer. You're just reading some words off of a paper and everybody's not praying out there with you. They're just listening to you read some words off of a paper. And that's what the Pharisees would do is they would do things that should have been done from a totally different motive like prayer. Jesus actually specifically addressed prayer. And he said, these guys, he said, they pray on the street corner and they pray loud where everybody can hear them. He said, but they're not praying to God. He, God doesn't even hear them. They're praying so that people will honor them, so that people will hear them. Then he, then he compares the sinner who's on the other street corner, and he's beating his chest, and he's going, God, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. I don't even know how to pray correctly. But I'm, and he says, God honors that prayer and loves that prayer way more than he does this religious prayer from this person. Amen. Now, how does that apply to us? Well, how does that apply in your worship? You know, when we come, when we come to worship on Wednesday nights, Sunday mornings, when we come, how do, you, how do you worship and why are you worshiping and who are you worshiping for? I saw a little skit one time where uh, the, they, had, they showed a group of people worshiping and they were, uh, the people were singing what their thoughts were. And so they had this lady and her hand was like this and she was, and she's like, oh, my ring is so beautiful. <laughs> she's looking at it and then 
another guy was doing this, and he was thinking, oh, I can't wait to that, eat that brisket and watch football today, you know. But on the outside, they look beautiful. This is what Jesus is coming at here. He's coming at that, and he's saying, that is so displeasing to me. But yet, people will look at people that are singing loud or singing pretty or, you know, hands are high, and they think that those people are worshiping, and they may be. We don't know. We don't know what their heart is, is doing with God. But whatever you see on the outside may or may not have any correlation to whether they are actually worshiping God or not. And that's what he's addressing here. He's saying, y'all are doing everything right on the outside. Man, y'all look like y'all are people of prayer. Y'all look like y'all are holy. But he said, your heart is far from me. How many of you know that the motive with which we do things is of the utmost importance. I mean, it's the difference between God receiving your sacrifice and rejecting it. It's the difference between on that last day when we stand before him, it's the difference of receiving a reward for what you've done or it being burned up. And it really goes, it always, it goes back to the motive. You know, that's why we talk about motive a lot because what about when you give? Does it matter why you give? Or does it just matter that you give? What about when you serve in the children's department? Or you serve in any area of ministry? Does it matter just that you serve? Or does it matter why you serve? Does it matter what your heart is when you are in that place serving? This is what he's teaching us here is that it matters. It matters. The motive matters. He said they love the place of honor at feast. This is why Jesus said, he said, the first will be last and the last will be first. He said, because when you, when you honor yourself, you know, you may get that honor. You know, he, when they go to feasts or they go to places and they, they take that place of honor, that seat of honor, he said, yeah, you're getting it. Men are going to honor you. People are going to look at you. They're going to think you're great. And he's saying that is the only reward that you will ever have. Because when you stand before me, you will not receive a reward for that, that type of living. And he says at that moment, those who did that, the first will be last. And the last will be first. Amen. Then he goes on, verse 8, talking about titles. You know, they love to be called rabbi, teacher, leader. Verse 11, the greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Verse 13, he says, but woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. For you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. He says, the way that you're actually living it's, it's, you think that you're drawing people to God, but you're actually pushing them away. How many of you know that's a problem in America? I mean, that's a, that's a very legitimate issue that we face in the American church today. That people who bear the name of Christ, that they live in such a way that they actually push people away from God rather than, rather than to him. I mean, I can, we've all heard stories. We've all heard these types of stories where um, people have walked into a church. I've heard of, of people, a sinner, walking, in, walking into a church and people telling them uh, that they have to leave because they're not dressed right or, you know, whatever. You know, or they have tattoos or they have stuff. And they, I mean, I'm thinking these people are coming because they're in a place of sin, they're seeking, they're reaching out for God, and they're, the people who could actually lead them to God are the barriers. The people that are supposed to be the reconcilers, taking them, leading them to God, they're actually the barriers to God. You have to ask yourself that question about, your, about you. Are you actually leading people to God, or are you a barrier for people? Are you a stumbling block for people? That's what we have with the Pharisees. He said, you neither enter into the kingdom yourself, nor do you allow those who would enter to go in. 
Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte. And when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. Woe to you, blind gods, who say, if anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. And really what he's saying there, you know, it just, it's stuff that didn't make any sense to people. You know, it's burdens that, why are you putting this on people? What he's saying here is he said, if you swear by the temple, then your oath doesn't mean anything. In other words, if I swear to do this by the temple of God, well, then it doesn't mean anything because you only swore by the temple. But then he says, but if you would have said, we swear by the gold of the temple, then you're bound to it and you're obligated to do it as if there's any difference there. You know, they're focusing on things that, that don't matter. It's just like today, and, and we see this in the church world. Stuff that doesn't matter, people focus on it and they say, well, you know, if you don't do this or you don't act this way. I, I talked about Sunday how, you know, there's an entire denomination uh, that is devoted to having the correct Sabbath day. And I've, I've actually heard pastors from this denomination and they really believe that people are not saved at least this particular pastor I was listening to that these people that other Christians are not saved if they do not have church on the correct Sabbath day which in their mind is Saturday now do you think it really matters to God whether you have church on Sunday or Saturday it's the same thing the Pharisees did they would hold people to standards that that did, had nothing to do with pleasing God and when you look across denominations, you see this type of stuff. Well, you got to dress this way. You got to act this way. You have to do this, this, and this, or you're really, not, you're really not right with God. That's the same thing that the Pharisees did, and we have to be careful about doing that to people. So, he goes on, verse 18. If anyone swears by the altar, he says, you say, if anyone swears by the altar, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift that is on the altar, he is bound by his oath. You blind men, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? So whoever swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And whoever swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. For you tithe mint and deal and cumin, but have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others, you blind gods, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. So what he, what he talks about here is... He says that they would tithe off of their spices. So mint, dill, and cumin, he mentions those spices. And they would actually, when they would receive spices, they would actually tithe off of those spices. Now, can you imagine taking your spice rack and dumping out a thing of cumin and separating a, a tenth of it, getting all the particles and the grains just right, and you're tithing that because you somehow think that down to the particle that that's, that's pleasing to God. He said, but you think that that makes you right with God, but yet you're neglecting mercy, justice, righteousness, the weightier things of the law. You don't even practice those. You, in other words, you don't even show love to your, to your fellow man. You know, he, he tells the story of, uh, of the Good Samaritan. You know, the guy's laying on the side of the road. Who passes? He's, in, he's injured. He's been robbed. He's beaten. He's laying on the side of the road. Who passes him up? The same guys that are tithing mint and cumin and dill <laughs> are passing up a fellow brother that is injured in the ditch. And that's what he's addressing here. He said, you, you'll tithe off of your spices, but the things that I really care about, loving and helping your fellow man, you'll just pass him up and leave him in the ditch. How does this apply to you and me? Because as far as I know, no one in here tithes, you know, off of their spices, you know. Hey, if you wanted to, I mean, we could do something with it. But as far as I know, no one's doing that. But do we have religious duties that we do and 
that are sort of small in the eyes of God and then neglect weightier and more precious things. You know, I dare say, while coming to church is extremely important and necessary, that we can do that with church sometimes. Because we come to church and we think, oh, this is what makes me... I think most, peop- most Christians in America, their, their whole relationship with God is centered around coming to church. That is their relationship with God, is coming to church. I mean... If I, as long as I go to church on a Sunday or at least a couple time, a couple Sundays a month, you know that's my relationship with God. But what he's saying is, you're no different than the Pharisees if you do that because you're thinking that that pleases God and that you're right with God because you do that. But if you're, in the, if during the other six days of the week, if you're not caring about your fellow man, if you're not showing mercy to the the poor and the widow, if you're not showing love to to people that are hurting, that are in need, you're not living the gospel, he says, your church attendance doesn't mean anything to me. That's the same thing that he would say to the Pharisees in this instance. Verse 25, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! For you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence, you blind Pharisees, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside also may be clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Now let's stop right there for a minute because this is something that all of us have to guard against right here. So he makes the comparison. He says they're like they're like tombs. So you know, the tombs would be beautiful even in the cemetery today. You know, we go to the cemetery and the headstones if if it's at a good cemetery, they keep them clean and they're uh, you know, they've been power washed and they're clean, but everybody knows what's underneath the headstone. It's rotten bones. It's death. It's the grave. And that's what he's saying. He's like, on the outside, you guys are beautiful, but on the inside, it's rotten. It's dead. And all of us, doesn't matter who you are, has to guard against this. Because when your heart begins to move away from God in an area... It doesn't immediately show up out here. And what happens is, as a matter of fact, if you're good at putting up a front, you can be rotting away on the inside here from bitterness, from unforgiveness towards people, from lust. You could be rotting away in here, but on the outside, all of us are looking at you and going, oh man, that guy's a great Christian, or, or she's, she's a wonderful person. But that's because we can't see on the inside. And this is what God is getting at here, is he tells them, he actually tells them, he says, first, clean the inside of the cup, and that will cause the outside of the cup to be clean. As a Christian, our focus on being a man or woman of God should always be an inward focus. Now, I care what, to a measure, I mean, I care what you guys think about me. I care what the world thinks about me to a measure because I want to be a good witness. I want to be a good example, and I'm mindful of the things that I do outwardly because I know that I'm leading people, you're leading people, we're influencing people. So I am thoughtful and mindful about my outward, you know, the outward things that I say, the outward things that I do. But how many of you know that that is not as important as what's going on in here? And that our focus as a Christian has to always be on our secret, on our secret life and who we are, you know, in private, who we are before God. Because I think it's real easy to have two different lives. Amen. Verse 29. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous. 
saying, If we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. Thus you witness against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your fathers, you serpents, you brood of vipers. How are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Therefore I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of you some of whom you will kill and crucify, and some you will flog in your synagogues and persecute from town to town, so that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth, and from the blood of innocent Abel to the blood of Zechariah the son of Barakiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. Verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wing? But you would not. See, your house is left to you desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So that's Matthew chapter 23. And... You know, I look at our nation and our church culture here in America, and I actually, today, I was listening to a, a pastor, and he was, he was talking to younger pastors, and he said this, he said, you know, um, he said, I want to commend you on something. He said, first of all, he said, in this day and age that we live in, he said, I'm hearing some of the best teaching coming from young pastors than, than I've ever heard. He said, you know, uh, especially when I was a young pastor, he said, I'm not, he said, the sermons that you guys are giving are way better than the sermons I was given and some of my friends, he said, you know, we just didn't have the resources, we didn't have the internet, we didn't have the things that you guys have. And he said, so the sermons are getting better and better, the teaching is getting better and better, uh, the knowledge of God's word is getting better and better. He said, but you know, the, the problem I'm seeing is that as the teaching gets better, I don't see people's lives changing. He said, even though the, the, even though the preaching is good, I don't see that the people in the in the congregation are being affected any more than they were when we were preaching our sermons that weren't so good. And he wasn't really saying why that was the case, but he was just making that point that that concerned him and, and he wanted to know why. And then he went to the other part of, for the preachers themselves, he says, you know, when you, when you preach at that level and you have that high standard, you better make sure that your personal life lines up with what you're preaching. And so for the American culture, that's what, you know, that's one of the concerns is I believe there's more word that's been preached in America than any nation around the world. We have more access to the gospel, more access to the word, more access to the best preachers. You know, you could turn on any, any TV, and there, we, ha we actually have TV stations that 24 hours, just a constant flow of the word. You got ministries and websites <clears throat> that you can get on and you can download their sermons for free straight to your iPod. You got YouTube. You can get on YouTube and type in any preacher around the nation. He's going to have videos popping up of his sermons. We've got more word, more access to the word. But I think the danger for us as we look at the Pharisees is, are we just becoming smarter? From all the word, are we just getting and amassing and gathering knowledge, but so what? So you're smarter from all the word that you've heard, but does that make you a better person? Does it cause you to be a better follower and a better disciple of Christ? If not, then all the word that we're hearing, it's just, it's nothing, it's worthless. And I, I, I would throw this challenge out to you. I dare say you could take one sermon, maybe not this one, <laughs> but you could just take one sermon, pick out one sermon that's been preached, and if you took that sermon and you meditated on it and you actually applied the principles from just that one sermon, how your life would be radically different. I've done that multiple times just when I'm reading through the Bible and I read one chapter and I say, my God, if, if I didn't have another chapter in the entire Bible, if this was the only chapter that I had, 
And I just could diligently practice and follow what I see in this chapter. My God, I could be, I would be such a better person, a better Christian, better pastor, better leader than I am today. One example of that is the Sermon on the Mount. If you go to Matthew chapter 5, it's three chapters. If you read Matthew, you know, 5, 6, and 7, and you read where Jesus, the principles that he laid out, how, how a Christian should live, how the Christian life should look, if that's the only three chapters you had in the entire Bible, you, you would be so much more like Christ than you are today if we just diligently applied those principles. What's my point? Look, we need the whole Bible. We need the Word of God being preached. We need the sermons, all of that. But what good does it do if at some point we don't listen to it and be convicted in our hearts and determine to change and determine to apply it? The same pastor that was talking to the other pastors, the young pastors, he also started talking about being lukewarm. He started talking about the problem of being lukewarm in the church. And he said, he made this comment that, you know, talking to a congregation, and he said, I told them, I said, if you're, if you're in here and you fit the definition of being lukewarm, he said, it's not like a small thing, like go home tonight and you'll be, you know, think about it. No, he said, don't go to work tomorrow. <laughs> Get on your face before God. Cancel, cancel your, clear your calendar. Cancel your dinner plans. Get on your face before God because you do not want to leave this planet in that condition. And I feel like sometimes until we get that tenacity about change taking place in our life, it will never happen. It will never take place. How often, how long have you had a goal in your life to do something, maybe exercise or eat right or save money? Maybe you read books about it, you thought about it, you talked about it with your spouse, you even made some plans about it. But how many of you know none of that accomplishes the goal? I have. I mean, I've done that, you know, wanting to, uh, to, to work out or be disciplined in a certain area and you read about it, study about it, get information about it, you know, but none of that is the same thing as actually going out and accomplishing the plan and the goal. I would say this, the more word that you hear, the more word that you know and don't do it, then the more you are like the Pharisees. And this is, a good, this is a good standard for us. The more word that you know, the more that you understand about the word, and you don't do it, the more you are like a Pharisee. Because that, they, they, these guys knew the word inside and out. The scribes are the ones, they didn't have, you know, photocopiers. So the scribes are the ones that copied the entire law. They copied it by hand over and over. That was their job. That's what they did over and over by hand. Every day they wrote out the scriptures. How do you have copying the Bible by hand as your profession, but yet you could not recognize the Son of God? Does that frighten anybody else? Because I'm looking at thinking... The prophecies in the Old Testament is what foretold the coming of Christ. And they, how many times had they copied the prophecies by hand? For all I know, they'd copied it 30 or 40 times in their lifetime, but they could not recognize the Son of God when He came. That blows me away. What, is that, what does that tell you? Knowledge of the Word is not the same thing as doing it. Quoting Scripture is not the same thing as doing it. We had a guy stop by here today. Uh, uh, Brandon was <clears throat> telling me about that knew the word, you know, back and forth. And, and you encounter that. I mean, I've had, I've had people in my time in ministry. They stop by the church, and and they're, they're they might be homeless or just getting out of prison. But boy, they know the word inside out. Anything you try to tell them from the scripture, they'll finish your sentence. <laughs> they know the word back and forth, inside and out. But it shows you that knowledge of the word is not enough. It's the application of it that is important. And this is what Jesus is focusing on here. 
Turn with me to Luke chapter 16, verse 14. Luke chapter 16, verse 14. It says, Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, were listening to all these things and scoffing at him. And he said to them, Jesus said to them, You are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men, but God knows your heart, for that which is highly esteemed among men is detestable, In the sight of God. I want to read another scripture to you. John chapter 12 verse 42. He says, Nevertheless, many of the rulers, talking about the Pharisees, many of the rulers believed in him. So this is interesting. You know, typically the Pharisees did not really believe in Jesus. They were the ones that persecuted him. They were the ones that caused him all the trouble. But in John 12 42, it says... Many of the rulers believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. Now, these two scriptures that we just read, Luke chapter 16 and John chapter 12, verse 42, they go hand in hand because both of them, in in Luke, he says, Jesus looks at him and he says, You are those who justify yourself in the sight of men, but God knows your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. Then he tells them in John chapter 12, he's talking about a group of people that actually believed in God, believed in Jesus as the Son of God, but they would not confess him. For they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. How many of you know that we can learn from this? I mean, he, 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 can you imagine? I, I don't even, I don't even know that I can understand this fully. I don't know that I can fully grasp what's taking place in the heart of these men because it says they believed in him. Now, what are they believing? They're believing that he's the son of God. It says they believed in him. You're believing that he was the son of God. What, do you, what would you do if you believe that the son of God came from heaven, he's on earth, he's performing miracles, and he's standing in front of you? I mean, they believed. It said they believed it. They believed that he was the son of God. Now, what I know about God and my understanding about God, if I believe that he was standing in front of me, who cares about man's opinion? Who cares about what anybody else thinks? It's my creator standing right here in front of me performing miracles, performing signs. I mean, what would I not do for him? Who would I not forsake for him? It says they believed that he was the son of God. They believed on him. But because of the approval of man, they would not confess him. Because they were afraid of being tossed out of the synagogues. In other words, they had a position of power. They had a position of influence, and they were afraid of losing it. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. But I'm telling you, we live in a nation right now that for the most part, there's not severe persecution for Christians, but you can see in different... You can see in different places it's beginning to rear its head that when you are a Christian, it can cost you. One of the main places that you're seeing it today is in the universities. It is not popular to be a professor and to be a Christian, particularly a science professor. (laughs) But, I mean, you you know, there are stories of people that have lost their job over being uh, or a certain belief that they've had. How many of you know that those, those people that lost their job or that it cost them that, they probably counted the cost before they expressed their belief or before they said the thing that was going to get them fired. You know, there are people uh, that are being fired because of comments they've made about homosexuality. You know, there are people that I know that, have, that, I, that I've read about that have been fired because of, of uh, you know, rejecting evolution and believing in, in God as the creator. So what is that? Well, 
in those instances, those people had an opportunity to be quiet and just kind of put their beliefs in the, in the back and not really say anything about it. Even though they believed in him, they're not going to confess it because they have too much to lose. I'm just telling you that that's not okay. And that if you ever find yourself in that position and your belief in God, your belief in your principles is going to cause you, is going to cause you to lose something valuable to you, well, you've got to make up your mind now which is more important. Are you, would you be willing to lose your job over something like that? Because if, if not, then you're like the Pharisees. You believe in him, but not to the point where you would confess it because you're afraid of what you might lose. This is the, you know, we don't have any teenagers in here tonight, but this is the biggest problem that teenagers struggle with. Most teenagers, they do believe in God. They come to church and they hear about God, but when they go to high school, they cannot confess Him because what it will cost them in front of their friends. And they do not confess God at, at school because of what it will cost them. But the question is, if that's where you're at, I mean, do you really... Do you really even believe in him? I don't know how you believe in the Son of God and do that. But he says that's what they're doing. He says, For fear that they would be put out of the synagogue, they loved the approval of men more than the approval of God. I really believe that if you're going to do anything great for God, that you have to die to the approval of men. You, if you're going to obey God, you have to die to the approval of men. Because there, there'll, be all, there'll be times that you feel led to say something that is not going to go over well or that's not popular. To take a stand in your family, a, a, heart, a stand with your, with your kids or that's not popular amongst everyone else. Anybody ever encountered that, trying to live for God? You know, you have to have certain standards in your life or family that other family members don't other understand, other people don't understand. If you're going to obey God, you have to die to the approval of man. You have to realize that I, I serve God, and he's the only one that I'm trying to please. I love you, but I don't serve you. And I, and I love you, but you're not my master. He is. And so, he's the one that I'm living for. He's the only one that I'm worried about pleasing. Amen. Now, we have several things that I want to get into on this topic. And we're not going to get into it all tonight. We don't not going to try to get it cover it all tonight but this is something that we're going to be talking about for several weeks because I believe that we can learn so much from identifying what was happening in the Pharisees heart that God was so angry with that God detested so much and I think it's good for us to look at examples in history so that you don't repeat it because it's very important to see what was happening in their life and to compare it to see, are we doing the same things? You know, and like, we, like for example, we talked about the tithing of the spices. Well, no one tithes spices, but how does that compare to something that we might be doing today? That's what we have to identify. Is there today's equal equivalent of that? Are we making the same mistakes that they were making in a similar fashion? And I don't know about you, but periodically, I like to take time and to evaluate my life and to evaluate my relationship with God and to evaluate things that he's asked me to do and whether I'm doing them or not. To evaluate, as I, as I talked about knowledge, to evaluate the knowledge that I have the understanding that I have about Scripture, does my life as a Christian match the knowledge and the understanding that I have? Amen. Because I can tell you, there are people in this room, there are people in this room that have great revelation. You, God has given you and entrusted you with great revelation. Because you've been in church, or maybe you've even had the privilege of ministering the Word of God. 
And I can tell you that God has given you special insight and special revelation into certain issues. And I can tell you that that comes with a price. When God gives you revelation and understanding on a topic, it is not just so that you can make other people smarter. It is, first of all, so that you can live it. Number one. You, you, any revelation, any understanding that you have about the Word, it has to be part of your life and part of who you are first before you start teaching and telling other people that they need to be doing this. I've got this great revelation. I can tell you how to do it. Okay, but you have to be doing it in your life. And the Bible makes that very clear that when you receive a revelation, when you receive understanding from God that you are held to a higher standard in that area. And I fully believe this is one reason that God doesn't just hand out revelations left and right, that you don't always have people just new revelation here, new... But it's like sometimes you have to pay a price in prayer, pay a price with God before you get a certain understanding or certain revelation about something. Why? Because once He gives you that revelation, now you're going to be held responsible for acting on it. You're going to be held responsible in acting on the knowledge that He's given you. So it's actually his mercy that you don't have full revelation on some things because if you did, then you would be held accountable for doing it.